So I think we'll make a start. Um, great to see so many people here, um, so many people in person, and, and um, an even larger number um, following us on Zoom. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about what I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, just before I start, worth just saying to the people following on Zoom, first of all, hello, great that you're here. Um, well, there, I think you see what I mean. Um, you should be able to hear things clearly enough and you should be able to see the slides. If there are any problems with that, um, I think Stephanie Ullman will be in the chat. So the name Stephanie Ullman, if you um, contact her in the chat, she'll hopefully be able to help with any problems. And if you're following on Zoom, if you have any questions, comments during the course of this talk, again, feel free to put them in the chat and um, we'll try and well, I'll try and um, um, respond to as many of them as I can in the time available. Um, you should have, again, in Zoom, you should have the closed <laughs> caption option enabled. Um, but um, if you do use that, do just remember that it's an imperfect um, representation of what I'm saying. It may in some cases be better than what I'm actually saying, but, but, it, but it, it's almost certainly going to be different at times. Um, for the people who are here in corporeal form, um, as I say, great to see so many of you here. Um, this must be the, the youngest average age um, range of any crash event probably ever, which is, which is great. <laughs> um, we're not expecting any kind of fire test or anything like that. So if the fire alarm does go off, which I think is highly unlikely, um, there are two exits to this room here and there, and we'll just exit very calmly and, and there's a muster point, blah, 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 but we're not expecting anything, but hopefully that won't happen. Um, okay, so to get down to business, um, you know from the, the title really, that the sort of thing that I'm gonna talk about a little bit today, um, systems like um, chat, GPT have been in the news quite a bit. Um, those of you that have had a chance to look at the news today, we'll know that this particular system, ChatGPT, was banned in Italy today. Um, it's already been banned in a number of countries. Um, and um, that's something that hopefully I'll be able to say something about. I'm, I'm gonna try and, and um, give you some sort of idea as to how a system like that works, so that hopefully you go away with a bit of a clearer understanding of how it works. And I'm gonna do that, as you know, from the title by focusing really on um, empathy in relation to these systems. And I'll explain a bit more about what that is. Um, just so you know who I am, I'm Marcus Tomlin. I'm primarily based in the Machine Intelligence Laboratory here in Cambridge, but I also have strong connections here with, with CRASH that's, that's involved in organizing this event. Um, I've been um, developing basically language-based AI systems for, for more than 20 years now. Um, so things like speech recognition systems, machine translation systems, dialogue systems, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and the work that I'm going to be talking about today is stuff that I've, I've been working on in collaboration with a couple of colleagues. One of them is a current student of mine, um, Tarish Bansal who's done a lot of work on, on some of the aspects of what I'm talking about today. Um, and another colleague who used to be based here at CRASH, um, Shauna Kankana, has also been closely involved. So I'll be doing all the talking today because I'm here, but th these other people are, are also um, strongly associated with this work, so I want them to get the, the credit they deserve. Okay, so let's check that all this works. Hopefully it will. Um, so... I'm the project manager for a project based here at, at CRASH called Giving Voice to Digital Democracies. Um, we really look at the social and ethical impact of AI technologies and, and specifically um, language-based AI technologies. Um, you can see here some of the other people who are um, involved. And if you're interested in the kinds of things that we're talking about today, you can find out a lot more information on our web pages. You can just Google um, Giving Voice to Digital Democracies. If you like, that will take you there. Um, for those of you who are still using Twitter, and I realize that's a, that's a dwindling number of people, um, you can follow us on, on Twitter if you want to. That's where we give updates about what we're doing and, and you know, respond to things that are going on in, in the world relating to, to these kind of topics. Okay, but let's get things started properly. So um, I'm going to start with something that isn't related to language at all and then kind of segue to language. So you know, you're having a bad day, um, it's not going well, you're tired, you're fed up, your phone is almost out of charge, so you need to charge it up. So you go to um, the plug socket to charge it, and you see this, okay? Um, or maybe you're in a different country, and instead of that, you see this. 
Um, or maybe you're in a different country or maybe just a different type of building and you go to charge your phone and you see this, okay? Now, some of you, are, I'm sure, are just seeing plug sockets. Um, some of you might be seeing faces. And if you are, that's not unexpected. Um, it's a well-known phenomenon. You can see a little bit about it there on the top of that slide. Um, as human beings, we're very good at seeing human-like faces in things that do not have faces. And I think what interests me about this, this, um, this well-known phenomenon is that we don't only see faces, we often associate emotional states with those faces. So here's a little collection of these images from a relatively recent paper about this. I mean, again, you're free to interpret these however you want, but most people see these ones at the top being kind of happy and smiley and the ones at the bottom as being kind of angry or something and then various states of, you know, like sleepiness or something here and sort of bewilderment here. This is probably the face I use on a regular basis during a typical week, especially during term. Um, and so these are here really just to remind us that we're very good at perceiving faces and particularly emotions in objects that we know for a fact do not experience emotions. Okay, And that's my sort of starting point for this, because what I want to go on to, to look at um, are some of these systems, these language-based dialogue systems, um, sometimes called large language models, things like um, chat GPT. But I thought I'd start with a different example, just to remind everyone that chat GPT isn't the only show in town. There, there, there are lots more of these things. Um, this is Blender Bot 3 that was created by Meta, which is the company that, that, that kind of is, um, is responsible for Facebook. And this is a little interaction that I had recently with Blender Bot 3. So the, the, the text in white is what the automated system gives me, and, and um, mine is in, in dark blue on, on your right. So in case you can't read it, you know, it starts in a really annoying way by saying, hey, I'm here, let's chat. Um, you might say, my dog died yesterday. Um, he didn't, I don't know, no die. But, you know, that's beside the point. It says, I'm so sorry to hear that. How did it happen? Did you have a funeral for your dog? I say, she was old, she died at the vets. And then the box B says, I see. Well, hopefully she lived a long and happy life with you. What breed of dog was she? I, I'm improvising here and I say she was a poodle. And Blender Bot 3 says, oh, how cute. What was her name? I have two dogs myself named Baxter and Maxwell. Now, you know, Blender Bot 3, an automated, an entirely automated dialogue system created by Meta. But in an interaction like that, you might think, how, how sweet. This system cares about me. It cares about my suffering. It cares about my anguish, about my, my dead dog. But then you think about it a little bit more. And, you know, it, it's told me that it owns two dogs itself. Um, automated systems can't own dogs. You need, you know, licenses and things. And so clearly that's just untrue, right? It's telling me lies. And that may have an impact on the way I interact with this system. Um, let's see what ChatGPT does in this situation. So this is a system that's been getting a lot of attention created by the company OpenAI, um, released kind of late last year and, and has received a lot of attention since. Well, you kind of read this a bit more, so I'll just quickly give you a gist of it. So again, I'm doing my usual shtick here. Um, my dog died yesterday. I'm sorry to hear that. Losing a pet can be very difficult as they become such a big part of our lives and our families. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here to listen. Um, she was old. She died at the vets. It goes on. And Blender Bot, I mean, chat GPT is quite prolix. Um, so often the response is unless you, unless you um, sort of force it not to be quite long. So I'm not going to read all of this. But as you can see, it's quite um, empathetic, um, reflecting upon how awful it is when pets die and how grief is a natural process and all of this kind of thing. Okay. So again, it's really nice that chat GPT cares about my dog. You know, it never met my dog, but it, it really cares about it as much as, as much as I do. I don't really like dogs myself. Um, but the advice is so thoughtful. Okay. Um, but before we go on to try to determine whether this system is actually empathetic or not, it seems important to, to say something about what empathy is. You know, if we talk about another human being as being empathetic, what are we talking about? Well, although similar words have been used for many centuries, things like sympathy and being sympathetic, the word empathetic really made its first appearance in 1908, um, Edward B. Titchener. Um, there he is. Um, and a sort of high level, fairly simple definition would be something like it refers to the ability to understand or feel what another person is experiencing. Okay. Um, but it's possible to divide it into different subtypes. And the two most common ones are effective empathy and cognitive empathy. So effective empathy, to put it in very simple terms, is if I'm talking to someone and that person is so upset that perhaps they're, they're in tears, 
I might cry as well as a result of uh, understanding and, and almost sharing their emotional state. Okay? That would be a sort of classic example of effective empathy. Cognitive empathy is, is, is related but different in that it normally indicates a sort of cerebral understanding of what they're going through without necessarily replicating it. So this is what counsellors and psychologists often do. So if they're, if they're working with a patient who's profoundly upset and maybe in tears, it would be unusual, I think, for the counsellor also to cry, but the, the counsellor would give very good advice to try to help that person and, and, and try to give suggestions as to how they might, you know, improve their emotional state or something. Okay, so but there are different types of empathy. Um, this is interesting for various reasons. I mean, generations of philosophers have reflected upon empathy and how it fits into other things that we're, we're interested in, perhaps from a philosophical perspective. Um, this is Michael Sloat, Professor of Ethics at the University of Miami. Um, wrote a, just a really um, profoundly interesting um, book about the relationship between ethics and, and empathy. And his underlying um, argument really is that empathy is central to moral education and to moral development more generally. In other words, we would struggle to function ethically if as, um, as creatures we, we didn't have some empathetic capacity. And that all sounds perhaps very straightforward, very convincing. You might think, well, how could anyone disagree with that? Well, um, plenty of people have disagreed with it. One of the most conspicuous is, is Paul Bloom, Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Cognitive Science at Yale, um, wrote this really interesting book, Against Empathy, which if you haven't read it, I'd suggest having a careful look at it. Um, he argues the opposite. He argues that empathy is actually damaging from an ethical perspective. As he says here, it grounds foolish judgments and often motivates indifference and cruelty. It can lead to irrational and unfair political decisions. You might be thinking, what's he got in mind there? Well, it can range from domestic examples to kind of national examples, but it's things like, um, you know, if a surgeon was so empathetic that they could never operate on a patient because they think, oh, this will mean that the next morning this patient will be in pain, um, they couldn't function. So they have to sort of um, bypass their, their empathetic response in order to serve what, what has a, a much greater long-term benefit. Um, so these are some of the arguments that he makes against empathy. Um, so if that gives some sort of idea as to what empathy is and why it might be interesting from the, the perspective of perhaps a sort of philosophical frame of reference, um, this complicated business of how we might identify it and, and quantify it in human beings, I'll come back to the automated systems in a second, let's just focus on human beings um, for a moment. Um, well, this has been discussed many times and, and various um, measures or scales of empathy have been proposed since, say, the, the 1940s. Some of them date back a little bit before that, but really this has gathered momentum since the 1940s and particularly in, in the States. Um, these measures are often questionnaire based, and I'll give you an example in a second. They often use what's called a Likert scale, that basically you sort of score certain um, aspects of an interaction with another human being, say from one to seven, but it, it can be a different numerical range. The assessments can be first person, so I can try and quantify the extent to which I'm empathetic, or it can be second person, I can try to quantify the extent to which you're empathetic, or it can be third person. I can observe a discussion or an interaction between two people, and I can then try to determine how much one of them is being empathetic. Okay. Because we're dealing with humans here rather than automated systems, um, the focus can often be on um, physical cues, what they're doing with their hands, what they're doing with their faces, as well as linguistic cues. And these are often designed, as I've already suggested, really, for, for medics or, or counsellors or therapists, you know, people in whom we, we sort of expect to find a considerable capacity for empathy. Um, here's just one example. It's called the Therapist Empathy Scale. It was proposed by Decker et al. in 2014. This is designed to assess empathy in therapists, as the name suggests. There are nine items or sort of properties or qualities that are identified. I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. And this is a third person measure. So again, there's, a, there's an independent observer watching an interaction and they're trying to determine how empathetic the therapist is. And it uses a seven point Likert type scale. Um, and again, there are different subtypes of empathy. I'm not gonna go into this in huge detail, but I've sort of listed them there and I'll give you some examples in, in a second. So there are nine items in this scale. Here are just two of them. So um, 
concern is one of the items and that's given the description here i'm not going to read it all out but a therapist conveys concern by showing a regard for an interest in the client the therapist seems engaged and involved with the client and attentive to what the client has said the therapist's voice has a soft resonance that supports and enhances the client's concern expressions that kind of thing and then it classifies it in terms of the types of empathy that it's focusing upon attitudinal and attunement here um, but you see this emphasis on, you know, the, the voice quality and things like that, which is perfectly sensible in, in relation to human-human interaction. Um, and basically for each of these items, there, there are nine in total, you sort of score it out of seven, where one means pretty much not at all, seven means extensively. And so in your judgment, um, how was the therapist performing in relation to this particular item that you're focusing upon? Now, that focus on therapy and counselling is a good way of manoeuvring back to these automated systems because um, whether you like it or not, some of these systems are being specifically developed to serve that kind of purpose. Um, probably one of the best known is this system called the Wobot. You see what they did there? It's, it's <laughs> um, which has been around since um, 2017. Um, and as you can see here, it's a bit small, but it basically says, I'm an automated conversational agent, chatbot, delivered through an application on your smartphone. You can check in with me daily. I am ready to listen 24-7. So this is an automated counsellor, basically. And so if you're if you're struggling with, with, with some kind of mental health-related issue, um, you can go to Wobot. Wobot's there 24-7 um, and will respond in ways that are designed to be helpful, um, whatever that means in these, in these you know, kind of interactions. Um, and it's important that systems like that seem empathetic. Again, if it's a system that's specifically designed for a counselling purpose, if it was kind of rude and offensive or something and just didn't seem to care about you at all, it's unlikely people would go back to, to use it. So empathy or some kind of simulated empathy is crucial for these kind of systems. So that sort of brings me back to the question that's at the heart of this talk. Um, if we're talking about any of these kind of systems, whether it's Blender Bot 3 or, or Chat GPT or whatever, are they actually empathetic? We've seen some examples where they appear to be empathetic when they were replying very nicely about my fictional dog that had died. Um, but are, are they actually responding in ways that we can classify as being empathetic? Well, I think in order to answer that question, we need to say a little bit more about what these systems are and how they function. Um, and so I thought I'd sort of focus on um, the, the sort of core of the system like chat GPT, just because it's been receiving so much attention recently. Um, GPT is this little acronym that gets used. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about this system recently, and I would say 50% of the time people get that sequence of letters right, and 50% of the time they don't. It's often um, GTP, it's often GCP, it's <laughs> various combinations of letters that sound a lot like these. Um, what it's supposed to indicate is generative, pre-trained, transformer, okay? It's a model that was introduced by OpenAI, the company behind chat GPT, um, in 2018. One of the interesting things here is that um, that's actually a long period of time in the development of these technologies from 2018 to the present, and you know, it's about five years. That's an age. That's a long, long period of time. And yet the same basic model is being used. There are reasons why that's the case that I may come to if I have time. What do the elements in this little acronym stand for? Well, generative, that simply means that this is a system that can generate outputs. It's not just going to a corpus of existing texts and retrieving a sentence and then presenting that. In a lot of the discussions of chat GPT in the media and everything, that they, they, they say it has access to a database and it picks out sentences from a database. It doesn't, it doesn't do that at all. It's not a retrieval system, it's a generative system. That's what the G means, okay? So that takes care of that. Um, what does pre-trained mean? Well, it simply means that it's been trained extensively on huge amounts of data um, by the team that designed and constructed it, i.e. by a subset of the Petri work at OpenAI. Um, what does that mean in more detail? It means something a bit like this. So the training process is important because that sets the parameters for the model and for the transformer. And that just means that the various numerical weights that it uses are set as a result of the training process. And it's been trained on an unimaginably huge amount of data. Okay? It's literally trained on trillions of words, where a trillion is normally interpreted as being million, million. 
Now, if you're like me, when you think about, you know, okay, what does a trillion words look like? My brain doesn't really quite function like that. I can't really see it. It's almost a kind of meaningless thing. It's just like a bunch, like a, a, a load of words. So I was thinking of ways of, of maybe trying to make it a little bit more comprehensible. And I don't know whether this helps you. It sort of helps me when I think about it. So if you take a novel that's often considered to be quite a long one. So there's a novel by Charles Dickens called David Copperfield. Um, if you think of it in pages, it's about 500 pages. If you think of it in words, it's about 360,000 words. Okay, So it's quite a long novel that a lot of people don't read because it's too long, um, but it's about 360,000 words. So in order to read a trillion words, you would have to read about 3 million novels that are as long as David Copperfield. Right? You haven't done that. I haven't done that. If we added together between us all the novels that we've read in any languages that we know, we wouldn't get anywhere close to that, right? I'm not even sure that you know, it's possible to, to do that, you know, with, with, with um, any kind of sensible kind of resources, right? So if that gives you some idea of the amount of, of data this thing is trained on, that's perhaps a good way to, to think about it. And it's specifically trained using what's called next word prediction. So what that means is that the model is presented with an incomplete sequence of words, and it has to predict or guess the word that's needed to complete it, right? And then as a result of its prediction being compared to the right answer, the weights in the model are modified and adapted so that it's more likely to predict a better word the next time. So the bit in blue here towards the bottom sort of captures the gist of this. So it's how likely is word X, the one that's being predicted, given both the K words that precede it, so all the ones that we've got so far, um, and the parameters of the model. So these little numerical weights that determine how the model performs. And this process is repeated millions of times until the model reaches a satisfactory level of performance. Now, if you want an example of what this feels like in person, again, I haven't set this up in like an automated way here, but I thought it'd be fun to, to, to turn you into sort of um, a transformer and see how you cope with the training. So here we've got a picture and the text is, you know, the Beatles were John, Paul, George and, okay, I had one response there, Ringo. Any other responses? Okay, everyone seems pretty happy that the answer is Ringo. Nine times out of 10, the answer would be Ringo. Um, was, that, was that an answer for there? <laughs> okay. Um, the actual answer in this case is Pete. Yes. Yes, I thought it was an answer. Yeah, that's good. There's always one person who knows the answer. Um, so it's Pete. Pete Best was the drummer in the Beatles before Ringo um, joined. So, and I've tried this. If you ask Chat GPT, um, you know, who were the members of the Beatles, it says John Paul George and Ringo. If you say who were the members of the Beatles in 1961, it says John Paul George and Pete Best, <laughs> right? And so it's learned that as a result of this kind of training. So if you were the transformer here, you would have predicted the wrong word and you would have learned that in addition to Ringo, which, it, which usually is the right answer, there's another possible answer which may be relevant in certain contexts, right? That's, that's the form that the training takes. So that takes care of the pre-trained bit. Um, what does the T mean? So GPT, we've looked at generative, we've looked at pre-trained, so we come to transformer. Well, a transformer is a, a specific type of neural network, and I'll say more about that in a second. And it was introduced by Google in a, what's become a very famous paper from, from 2017. Um, I said that 2018 was a long time ago. That's when the GPT framework um, dates from. 2017 is even longer ago. Right. So again, a transformer is, is, a, is an old architecture in technology terms, right? Every six months, usually, there's a, there's a big step forward. This has been in place for the best part of six years as a, as a significant model, partly because it's so brilliantly done. Um, but as I say, there, there are other reasons, I think, why it's, why it's lingered. What's a transformer? This is a transformer. This is the famous image from the paper that I referred to a minute ago. And I'm not going to talk about this in huge detail. That would be a lecture in its own right. I'm going to focus in on a few bits just to give you a flavor of it. But before I do that, um, I want to risk distressing some of you by taking you back to maybe some of the maths that you did at school just a little bit. And some of you might, might be doing this stuff currently at school, which is very helpful. Um, matrix algebra. Okay, so very simply, matrix algebra uses things like vectors and uses things like matrices. A vector is just like a sort of column in a spreadsheet or something like that. 
and you can have a vector and if you if you change it so that it becomes like a row in a spreadsheet you've transformed it right so that's relatively straightforward and vectors can be um, added and subtracted and multiplied okay they, they can have these basic operations applied to them a matrix is basically just a collection of vectors that have the same dimensions um, and again given a matrix you can you can um, you know, alter its alter its configuration, right? So, so, so you can you can um, turn the rows into columns and vice versa, basically. Matrices can also be added, subtracted, multiplied. Th those operations are a little bit more complex, but I've just given you a sense here of how you can multiply these two matrices um, to create a, a third matrix. Okay, and if you're not used to this, it may look a little bit weird, but these are pretty simple mathematical operations, right? Two times five. I don't think that's beyond the scope of anyone in the room. <laughs> you know, three times two, relatively straightforward. Six times one is even easier. Add them together and you get the number that you want, right? Okay, so having said that, let's go back to this transformer and just talk through some of the initial steps of it. So people often assume that a system like ChatGPT has a profound knowledge of you know, English grammar and syntax and Spanish grammar and syntax and Italian grammar and syntax and French grammar and syntax, because you can, you can interact with it using all those languages and many others. The, the honest response to that is it doesn't really know anything overtly about any language at all. Okay? The first step really in any kind of process like this, when, when you're training it um, or indeed giving it an input, is that the words you use are mapped to numbers. So the word all might be mapped to 23, and the word elephant might be mapped to 450. It doesn't matter which number, it's just an arbitrary mapping, but it has to be consistent. So whenever you use the word all, it will always be mapped to 23. Okay? So if you've got, you know, like 50,000 words in your vocabulary, you've got them all mapped to, to unique numbers. If you have it as an input, a sentence like it will make sense, that just becomes a, a vector of numbers, right? 12, 23, 679, and three. In this case, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. Right? That's what the input to the system becomes. So it knows nothing about sense and what sense means and making and all of this. It just knows that <laughs> sequence of numbers overtly. And then what happens is that each word is associated with an embedding vector, really, that, that forms an embedding matrix because we've got multiple words. This matrix, that the values in it, doesn't really matter what they are for this purpose, but these are some of the values that are set during the training process. And basically, one way you can think about the embedding matrix is a way of trying to capture um, the semantics of the particular words that are in the sentence, okay, broadly speaking. So I think it's sometimes useful to think of it like this. So here I've just got, you know, a, a matrix where it's got what, five columns. In practice, it might have 512 columns. And all of those numbers along one of the lines can be um, a point in a 512 dimensional space. Okay. Now, again, I can picture a two-dimensional space. That's just a bit of graph with next y-axis. I can kind of picture a three-dimensional space. Much beyond that, I'm struggling. There may be some mathematicians here who can picture a 512-dimensional space. Um, if so, you should probably monetize that because uh, that's not a simple thing. So if we reduce the dimension, so we've just got three, this is the kind of thing that the embedding um, matrix is trying to achieve. And so here words that have fairly close semantic connotations like king and queen, you'd expect to be in a, in a similar space in the 512 dimensional space, whereas something like cat, which doesn't regularly occur in the same context perhaps as, as king and queen, would be further away. So that's what I mean about a sort of rough capturing of the semantics. The next stage of this is the positional encoding. Now, again, I'm not going to talk about that in detail. If you're interested, have a look at the paper. It uses a very clever system that uses sine and cosine functions. But basically, it's just trying to uniquely encode the position of the word in the sentence so that at any point in the processing, we know that the word it was the first word in the sentence and that the word all is the second word in the sentence. Okay, And that just gives us, again, another, another matrix. And then basically what you do is you take the embedding um, matrix, the positional encoding matrix, and you combine the information. So here I've just done it on, on for, for the first word, um, the embedding vector, if you like, but it's the positional vector, and you just combine the values, right? Which means that the inputs that go into the transformer are just vectors with numbers in, 
That's all that really matters here. Um, they're just vectors with numbers in. And that's what gets passed into the next stage. And the next stage of the transform is a particularly important one. This is where it tries to determine how the words in the sentence relate to each other. Okay, so if I got a sentence like Fred was happy when he won the lottery, you know, if we speak English as a first language or as a second language, we know that Fred and he refer to the same entity. Right? You, you know that it's Fred who won the lottery, not Bill or someone, right? Assuming we haven't got a larger context in which, in which it's clear that, that we're talking about someone called Bill. Okay, and that's what this multi-head attention tries to achieve. It does it using a clever method that, that that's really um, based on the kind of um, database query search um, techniques that have been around for a while. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, you can think of it a little bit like what happens when you try and search for a video on YouTube. Um, you submit your query. That's you saying, you know, I'm trying to find the video with person X in about this particular topic. Um, there are a set of keys, which are the little bits of information about the videos that are sort of stored in the database. Um, and then what's returned is the value that, that, that is the best match for what you're searching for and what was in the database, right? That's kind of underlying this, but it doesn't really matter because the point I want to make here is that the inputs we know are just vectors of numbers that are combined into a matrix. They go through three linear levels that transform them into further matrices, um, Q, K, and V, which corresponds to query keys and, and, and values, ones we've just seen. The first two are combined to create another matrix that's just a matrix full of numbers. They're called the attention scores. And then that's combined with, with, the, with the one at the bottom. Um, and that, um, that's the information that's passed on to the next part of the transformer, okay? So when people um, talk about AI, um, I mean, people like me um, who develop these kind of systems, I tend to use phrases like artificial intelligence um, when I'm giving a talk. Um, because people often search for it, and it means they find out about the talk, and then it means that they show up and, and listen, which is great. Um, in my day-to-day -day life, I, I almost never use a phrase like artificial intelligence. I just think of all this stuff as applied matrix algebra, right? Because you know what matrix algebra is now, because we had a little reminder course. This is just matrix algebra. This is kind of A-level matrix algebra that's being performed incredibly rapidly on, on hugely um, significant um, compute resources. Okay, that, that's really what's going on in the transformer. And as I say, that the things that go on elsewhere are just very similar. I'm not going to go through them now, but they're, they're different sort of forms of matrix algebra that are applied to combine vectors with vectors and matrices with matrices in order to try to provide some sort of sophisticated analysis of the input and to generate an appropriate output. That's really what's going on. There is one additional stage that's worth mentioning, um, because this is where some of the power of a system like ChatGPT comes from, and that's really a stage of fine tuning, and it's called reinforcement learning for human, from human feedback. Basically, you have a system that's already pretty well trained, you get it to generate n different responses to the same input, because you can make it do that. You then get a whole load of human participants to rank order those outputs. You know, this one's better, this one's the next best, this one's awful, so it goes at the end. And then the model is automatically updated and modified so that it's more likely to output the good responses, the, the, the responses that the human beings thought were good. So here's just one example. And again, this is actual an example from ChatGPT. It's so prolix that I had to do a little bit of prompt engineering to say just reply using one sentence, please just use one sentence, and then it finally does when you convince it. Um, so the input was, should we be afraid of chat GPT? As they clearly are in Italy, because I've just found it. Um, and what chat GPT tells us is, no, chat GPT is not capable of causing harm to humans. Chat GPT is designed to provide helpful responses not to cause fear or harm. Fear of ChatGPT is unnecessary since it has no physical form or ability to act on its own. ChatGPT is designed to follow ethical principles, making it safe to interact with. Fear of ChatGPT is unfounded as its purpose is to assist and enhance human interaction, not to replace or harm humans. So if we were participating in this part of the training process, we'd have to rank one of those. And you might think, well, one, you know, the first response there isn't so good because it doesn't say why it's not capable of causing harm, whereas something like maybe um, three or four give a little bit more of an explanation, so we might want those to be higher, and then that will feed back into the model and it will be fine-tuned to prefer the kind of 
um, responses that the human participants have, have identified. Okay, and that's a really important part of, of the training of these systems at the moment. So <clears throat> when people say, what does a system like ChatGPT know? It depends what you mean, right? This is really an epistemological question. What does it mean to know something? What do we understand that to, to indicate? Um, in essence, they know that given an input vector, such as the one you see there in green, just a series of numbers, it knows that the output vector that's most likely to be appropriate is that other sequence of numbers. That's what it knows. Okay, And it's only when we decode the number mapping um, that we start to respond to it in a different way. We start to see some sort of, um, I don't know, empathy emerging, because maybe the numbers in green mean I'm feeling sad today, and that was the input. And as we've seen, you know, maybe that maybe the response is something like, I'm sorry to hear that. And suddenly it cares about us, right? Um, so are dialogue systems like ChatGPT actually empathetic? What do you think? Well, there's all sorts of things to consider. I mean, these aren't straightforward issues. A lot of it comes down to definitions about what empathy is, what being human entails, what constitutes an automated system. If you ask people like me, and I guess I kind of I really as an AI, de AI developer, <clears throat> in my experience at least, and you know, <laughs> having had many conversations with colleagues about this, um, I would say we're extremely skeptical, and that's me being quite English about this, in that we don't think for one minute these things are actually empathetic. I mean, you've seen the matrix algebra underlying this. Do you really think that's what empathy looks like? Maybe you do, and maybe that's fine, but you know, I'd be very, very um, skeptical of that. Um, <clears throat> um, Emily Bender and some of her colleagues have, have um, described these systems as being merely stochastic parrots. Um, parrots because, you know, you can train a parrot to learn a sequence of words and it can repeat it back to you and it seems meaningful, but it's just a series of noises that the bird has learned. Um, and yet, <clears throat> even though these systems <clears throat> are not empathetic, they can certainly respond in ways that we perceive as being empathetic. We've already seen examples of that. I've got a couple of more examples, but um, I don't really need to go through these too much. Um, this is me asking ChatGPT, are you empathetic? And I think quite reasonably it says, as an AI language model, I do not have emotions or feelings, so I cannot experience empathy in the same way humans do. But it goes on to say it can um, give information that, that relates to empathy, right? You know, it can uh, communicate in ways that seem appropriate or helpful. And then as we've seen, if you give it an input like I am lonely, um, it seems to respond in ways that, that would, can easily be perceived as being empathetic. So it tells us it's not empathetic, but it responds in ways that seem to be empathetic, right? Now, if you think about this in relation to humans, there's a particular subset of human beings that have very low levels of empathy or non-existent levels of empathy, um, and yet are able to feign empathetic responses convincingly. Anyone want to suggest who this group of humans might be? <laughs> a few good suggestions there. I mean, um, basically psychopaths, right? Um, and there have been a number of studies looking at empathy levels in people who are, who are you know, medically classified as, as being psychopaths. Um, now, as, as, as um, one of those um, chat GPT responses to should we be worried indicated, you know, at the moment, systems like chat GPT don't have arms and legs, so they're unable to do us kind of physical harm in, 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 a, in a kind of, you know, way that you might associate with certain types of psychopaths. But nonetheless, um, fake empathy can be used very powerfully to manipulate um, and to exploit people. And in other areas that, it, that traditionally have been, you know, they haven't been automated, you see this at work. So empathetic marketing has been around for a long time. Given the L'Oreal example here, the key bit is the bit that's hardest to read in the middle. This is a slogan I think they've had and have used very effectively for about 50 years, which is an age in marketing for a slogan. It says, because you're worth it, right? So L'Oreal cares about you. It knows about you. It thinks that you're worth it, and therefore you should buy their product, right? This is potentially manipulative, you know, and it's been very successful. And I think systems like these automated systems mean that this type of empathetic marketing can be automated and micro-targeted at an industrial scale that we've never seen before. And I think that's something that, you know, may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing. At the very least, we need to think about it. So just to sort of start moving towards the conclusion here, I just wanted to say something about how when we have these automated systems which are not empathetic, but which can be perceived as being empathetic, how can we quantify that degree of perceived empathy? 
Well, this is something that my, my colleague and I, Shona Concanon, have done quite a lot of work on. And the, the approach we adopted was really to adapt an existing third person human based empathy measure so that it's appropriate for these human and um, computer interactions. So we gave ours the, the really like extraordinarily unpronounceable title of the empathy scale for human computer communication. I don't even know how you pronounce the acronym for that, but I don't really like acronyms. Um, and this is really an adapted version of the one I showed you earlier that was aimed at therapists. So um, you can see we've, we've kept many of these items the same, so concern, expressiveness, and we've just adapted the wording of it so that um, it's, it's better suited for the kind of human system interaction. So the system conveys concern by seeming to show a regard for an interest in the interlocutor. The system uses vocabulary and syntax to give the impression that it's involved with the interlocutor and attentive to what the interlocutor has said. If you remember the earlier one, there was a lot of emphasis on voice quality and things like that. Obviously, that's not relevant for the current generation of these systems. It should be a text-based interaction. And we use the same kind of scoring metric. So you can say whether it does this not at all or to a large extent. We added one item, which we call fallacy avoidance. And that's to really try and capture these weird things where some of these systems um, claim experience of things that we know they have no experience of. So this is the one I had earlier where Blender Bot 3 says, I have two dogs myself named um, Baxter and Maxwell. From an empathy perspective, for many people, that can be jarring. You know, you're lying to me now, so, so I no longer trust you as an empathetic friend. Um, so we call that a credibility fallacy. And we'll see another one later. It's whenever one of these systems claims experience, if it tells us that it has trouble sleeping, I know that's not true. If it tells us that it tries to drink a certain amount of water every day, I know that's not true. So these are credibility fallacies. And you can measure empathy in other ways as well. So those human-based questionnaire assessments are kind of useful, um, but there are also automated metrics. I'll just whiz through this quite quickly. It's more just to give you a sense of it. Um, so here I've got this one and this two. The other ones I'm mainly going to say something about. The others are a little bit more complex. They use neural networks in order to assess the output of neural networks. So it all gets a bit more complex. But this one and this two are a bit, more, a bit easier to explain and understand. They basically, basically are two um, metrics for diversity, <laughs> diversity in the output of the system. Because if there's a lack of diversity, then systems can sometimes fail to seem empathetic. So here's just you know three examples. If you say, I just hiccuped, and the system says, I'm sorry to hear that. I stubbed my tongue, sorry to hear that. My grandmother died yesterday, I'm sorry to hear that. You start thinking, well, I mean, this is like a stochastic parrot thing again, right? There's got to be more diversity for me to be convinced. So these metrics were introduced a few years ago. Um, the way they work is you basically count the, the number of n-grams, so that might be single words or pairs of words or triples of words, and then divide it by the total number of words. So if you were counting unigrams, um, you'd, you'd it, in a sense, it's like, I'm sorry to hear that, you'd say that you've got um, five of them, okay? And so if you've got um, two different responses that you're comparing, and one of them, you know, the, the, the total number of words in the response was 100, and it only contained five, um, you, five unigrams, five unique words, um, then you get a certain measure. Um, whereas if you had the same total number of words, but there were 25 distinct unigrams, you get a higher score from this metric because it reflects the fact that there's greater diversity. Okay, hope you get the same. <laughs> And the point is simply that you can use these automated metrics to try and compare the performance of these systems. So here I'm just comparing the performance of BlenderBot, BlenderBot 3, the one that I mentioned earlier, and then GPT-3, which underlies chat GPT. <clears throat> and broadly, you can see that, that um, GPT-3 is better at diversity, but BlenderBot 3 is better at seeming empathetic. But then you also need the human-based metrics that Shauna and I have been developing, because one of the reasons why BlenderBot 3 um, seems more empathetic is because it, it very frequently introduces these credibility fallacies. So here, you know, the input is about anxiety attacks and Blender Bot 3 says, I know what you mean. Anxiety is a horrible feeling. I've had them since I was a child. And it's like, what? <laughs> you know, that makes no sense. <laughs> You're literally a whole load of matrix algebra. You know, <laughs> you were never in math is, right? Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. And this is just a sort of quick summary of, of some of the points that I've tried to sort of um, get through. So 
If you want my opinion, I would say we cannot currently automate empathy in any kind of way that's even close to, to what we experience um, as empathy as human beings. Okay? But we certainly can create automated systems that produce outputs that can be perceived as being empathetic. Okay? Therefore, since we create these systems that do not possess empathy, but can seem to be empathetic, they are in effect um, stochastic psychopaths. Okay? Um, and the degree of perceived empathy that they're able to generate can be measured in various ways. Some of them human-based metrics, um, sort of thing Sean and I have been developing, and some of them automated metrics. And I think you need both of those approaches in order to reach sensible conclusions about the degree of perceived empathy. So this leaves us with more questions than answers, really. So should we develop these kind of systems so that they seem empathetic? You know, is this is this a good thing that, that we should be focusing our research attention on? Um, should we be using these kind of systems to provide mental health support? You know, should we be trying to automate that type of counselling? Um, what are the dangers of, of having systems that feign empathy? I mean, empathetic marketing, I've mentioned that there are other areas where this might be problematical. And are the designers of such systems, especially when the, the, the companies that sell them um, are likely to earn a lot of money through, through making these systems available, is that really a form of exploitation? Are they really exploiting um, the loneliness and vulnerability of certain subsets of users? Um, or are there benefits to these things? And, and are these systems that make the world a better place? Um, and I'm hoping that in the last five minutes, you'll be able to answer those questions for me because you know, you're know you already in some sense using these systems. I'm sure many of you use, you know, whether it's Alexa or Cortana or whatever your favorite, or I'm sure some of you have been playing with, with chat, chat GPT in, in, in recent weeks. Um, and I'd be genuinely, genuinely interested to hear what you have to say. And I think there may be some things coming through on Zoom, so I hope you can definitely complete those in. But yeah, any... Any thoughts, any comments, any questions? We've got a few minutes because we started a, a little bit late, so I'm happy to, to overrun a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Why does chat GPT appear to be quite empathetic? Is this <clears throat> the result of this, uh, this reinforcement training that you mentioned where the instructor told to select empathetic questions? Or is it that the input text on which it was trained that somehow empathy dominated over adversarial uh, thing yeah. or is it such that without these experiments that if you for example average all of faces together that the average face looks much more beautiful than the majority of the individual mm -hmm. ones mm -hmm. because average the sentiments of a lot of input text together yeah doesn't appear to be yeah. more beautiful more empathetic yeah very good question um i think my, my my brief answer is i think it's both of those initial things that you mentioned i think it's partly to do with the initial training stage but i think it is also partly to do with the human in the loop um fine tuning stage if you like the reinforcement learning stage i mean it's difficult to know for certain exactly how many people were involved in that exactly which examples they were given because again that's information that hasn't so far as far as i know been made public um but given the way that um, OpenAI emphasize that, you know, they're trying to develop a sort of you know, an ethical system that behaves in appropriate ways, I would be astonished if that hadn't featured as a, as a, as a substantial part of that reinforcement learning page. So I think it's both of those things. It doesn't have to be either or. The table that you showed that compared the scores of that chatbot and GPT-3, have you run those numbers on GPT-4? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. I mean, I imagine the patterns will be different. Um, 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 so just in case people don't know, um, GPT-4 is the, the even more up-to-date version of this kind of framework that was released, um, I forget when, like a few weeks ago, basically. Um, so we haven't had a chance to run, run that on it yet, um, but that's one of the things we'll be looking to do. Yeah. I mean, for the data that, that OpenAI have released, looking at performance on, say, um school exams and um, you get a significant improvement in for um gpt4 over gpt3 so so i would expect these numbers to be quite important i was interested that you've done like the term artificial intelligence can you suggest an alternative it's not too technical that would convey a more meaningful sense to the average person and could you also say what you think about whether machines could develop something that is yeah, the terminology issue, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a problematical one. I think that there isn't really a, a kind of straightforward alternative. I mean, 
Um, certainly, you know, I, I'd never use an expression like an AI. I mean, if I'm honest, that drives me mad. It's becoming so common and people are using it. But I, I tend to talk about them as being systems. But of course, that, that doesn't indicate um, as much about their purpose. There are lots of things that are systems that we might not think of as, as sort of being able to replicate human-like skills and abilities. So I think the terminological one is a problem, which is why AI continues to, to, to exist. So I don't think I have a sort of preferred choice. I mean, as I say, most of the time I'm, I'm talking to people who develop these things, so I'll just talk about it as a system. I think that's better than, than an intelligence. I mean, what the hell is that? It's a weird thing anyway to talk about. Um, and in terms of will they be able to develop something that we might recognize as human-like empathy? Well, Again, it depends a little bit on how we understand human empathy, you know, so so if you drop a hammer on your toe, I might wince because I've probably dropped heavy things on my toes. But that that knowledge and understanding of your state comes from um, my own embodied state. You know, I, I, I have taste, I have touch, I have sight, I have hearing. And, and so is it possible to develop empathy without having gone through a developmental process? That means we learn about the world and about the things that we encounter via that route. So there are teams of people, um, um, particularly in Japan, actually, that are interested in that and are looking at ways of, of um, automating the development of empathy within a system. So rather than just cheap tricks, really, like reinforcement learning that make it seem empathetic, can you actually make it empathetic in something that's much more human-like? That stuff's a long way off. But I think, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, that's probably going to be quite interesting. Um, but it's its very early stages at this at this moment. How, how possible is it to undermine these systems? So you talked about the wealth of data that goes in. Um, so I would imagine just me going in and putting something ridiculous in there is not going to have any impact whatsoever. But I guess, could, could you have bots go in as... Um, uh, uh, proposing to be people and putting a load of nonsense and you know if lots of that's going on then that's going to impact the output i i i mean I, I don't know of any particular case myself but i would be astonished if there wasn't already a whole set of kind of mischievous people <laughs> who are automating um techniques for compromising the performance of, of the, these kind of systems you know and and um, that's what's happened in the past I mean there was a system that was released by um, Microsoft quite a few years ago now but it's called Tay and um, it learned from user inputs <laughs> what you think the users were inputting I mean the most extremist kind of offensive stuff because then it starts outputting it I mean you know whatever you, you get in you tend to get out unless you have some kind of clever process for, for preventing it doing that so I'm sure that's that's happening. So in the recognized box it's it's difficult i mean if it's if it's just an input sequence of tokens i mean it's an input sequence of tokens i mean who generated it you know it, it's a different version of the problem you know if, if you get chat gpt to write an essay and a kid submits it as, as as school homework do we know it was generated by the automated system it's just a sequence of words you know until you know something about the process it's hard to say oh that was generated by a bot or that was generated by a human right so I think it's it's hard to know. Um, do you think that AI would be able to have a vessel that could replicate messages of communication to say entities that have gestures or facial expression? So could it become embodied in 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 the sense that it can be more expressive? Yeah, and again, there's there's, there's increasing um, there's an increasing amount of work on 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 that sort of thing. Um, I mean, as human beings, we tend to rely quite a lot on facial expression and gesture, and and there are modes of communication such as sarcasm, which often rely on um, tone of voice or facial expression. If I say something and pull a certain face, you'll know that I actually mean the opposite of that. These are all modes of communication that are beyond the reach of anything that's purely text-based. But if we really want systems that can replicate the full complexity of how we communicate as humans, then they need to be multimodal in that sense. It can't just be text. It has to be text and it has to be some approximation of facial expression or gesture or something like that. So, yeah, I think that's something that, that will emerge. Um, it's not there yet, but I think that 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 will happen in the relatively near future. All of this stuff will go increasingly multimodal, no doubt about that, no doubt. Uh, in support of how the system generates long enough text, would it be possible to actually make people or make GPT output some kind of um, uh, 
kind of multiple some some incentives that are just there to have a big find that people like people detected like and that yeah. it wouldn't really have a big impact on the quality of the app. Absolutely. And and that's something that there are already um um techniques for doing that. It's called watermarking. And basically the system will output what appears to a human just to be a normal text. But encoded in it, there are certain patterns that can be automatically detected so that you could say, you know, with like 99% certainty, um, that was generated by an automated system. The problem is those kind of methods rely on the companies that produce the system building it into the system. And um, maybe there are reasons why that, that becomes something that's desirable from their perspective. And OpenAI say they're working on watermarking, um, but again, it's not there at the moment, but, but I think it's it's likely that that will become more common and that might help with some of the concern about how do I know whether it's generated by, a, by, by an automated system or not. The problem is that of course, we tend to think in simplistic ways. We think texts are either written by humans or they're written by automated systems. That's not usually how it works. You know, you, you get it generated automatically and then you modify it. And then it gets much harder because if you break the code having modified it, then it's written by human as far as an automated test would, would determine. If that makes sense. Um, the distinction you made in the beginning between the factor and the yeah. entity. So the I'll get that. Yeah, the and also the, the cycle path. They, they must have problems with that. I assume because otherwise they wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 um, the um, the person I mentioned, um, Paul Bloom. I mean, one of his arguments is that um, psychopaths are clearly empathetic. They might get low scores on empathy tests, but they're clearly empathetic because if you want to cause somebody to suffer, you need to understand their experience of the world in order to make them suffer. Right, so that's a form of empathy, um, and and I think he's right in that. You know, so again, it often comes down to what is it that we're quantifying, and someone might get a, a low score on one of these traditional empathy tests, and yet we might conclude that they have high levels of perhaps a certain kind of cognitive empathy. So it might mean that they, they remain sort of heartless enough to perform some awful action, but they must understand enough about the other person's experience in order for it to be a truly awful action. Right. So, so those things I think are complicated, and, and they make the whole discussion around this complicated. The automatic metric to measure the performance is high, right? Yes, I mean because um, yeah, again with the current generation, you know, when I tell um, ChatGPT that, that that my dog has died, it doesn't cry, <laughs> you know. So its response is expressed in sequences of words, which unless it says something, which, which in my experience it never does, like, oh, I'm in tears now, you know, it might describe its emotional state, but, but in my interaction with it, it's never done that. It's always something that's much more at the cognitive end rather, rather than any kind of emotional end, really. Um, but if we get a generation of things that have faces and, and gestures, and maybe they will start crying when we tell them awful things about what happened to our dogs. <laughs> Uh, I don't question that. Do you think the tragic will sing a question in a logical way? Say that again. So, will the chat GPT think of question, math question in a logical way? So, if you ask it a math question, like because I just um, when I, I, I like the math game, so I just do the pseudocode and I really, um, so I'll say, I just uh, uh, well, I just put a soda code in the chat GPT and it just gave me an answer and uh, gave me a very kind of broken the soda rules answer. Mm -hmm. And then I asked if he know the rule. He told me, um, it told me it got the knowledge rule. Mm -hmm. So I just computing why it know the rule and it just uh, broken the rule to mm -hmm. get an answer. Like it, it gave me a zero number, like zero right. in the soda code. Right. Well, again, even for those kind of particular tasks, it, it would have been trained on on patterns. It would have seen, you know, sequences of numbers in the input, sequences of numbers that that, that are deemed correct during the training process, and it would have been trained to output those correct sequences. Um, and that's true whether it's sequences of words or or or, or, or you know mathematical games or anything. Um, that's why it it can 
respond in English or Italian or French. It doesn't know anything overtly about any of those languages. It's just different sequences of numbers that are mapped to different sequences of other numbers. That's all that's going on. So it's the same that applies even for a specific task like that. So whether that's logical, depends a bit what you mean by logical. Is it axiomatic deductive? Not really, but it is a pattern matching algorithm that underlyingly is logical in some sense. It's not random. <laughs> I have a general question to, to Jack GPD. Um, does it only generate uh, responses or it's use our uh, input to train the, the network um, regarding to internal data in the company or something like that? So, so when you input into it, yes. does that data? Yeah, I mean, if when when you when you sort of um, sign up to use chat GPT, there's a load of things, you know, all, all these things that you agree to that everyone just clicks without reading. You know? um, and it's true for so many of these systems. I mean, it's true for social media systems. So like if you use Facebook or something, if you if you like an image, if you dislike an image, even if it's just something that your cousin posted, you know, what they're having for dinner, um, you're working without getting paid um, because um, you're, you're giving data to the company. The company will then sell that data to people so that they can advertise. And that's where you start getting, you know, micro-targeted advertising. Um, so with all of these sort of technologies, you know, they release it to the public so that you can debug it for them, you know, and, and you're doing good work for the company every time you input something into it and they're not paying you. So it's very kind of you all to, to <laughs> be so willing to be exploited, but that's something you lure people in with an enticing technology and then they, they're, they're, a, they're an unpaid workforce. Um, it's interesting because I asked Church in the he answered um, that generate the response it's not used my data that's why the question well it doesn't always respond in ways that are factually correct <laughs> are there any online things that you should have yeah. any that you picked? there are several um one maybe that addresses a slightly different angle i'm trying to combine a few questions um if we look at companies and large corporations that that um, are behind all these new systems. And if we're considering their interests, um, what would actually happen if AI could eventually um, imitate empathy? Um, what do you think would be the consequences of that? Would, would this be used to kind of take advantage and um, influence human decisions and behaviors? Yeah, I mean, I, so, so the question is broadly, you know, if, if we got to a point where we could automate empathy yeah. properly, what, what implications would that have? Um, I think it would have the same sort of implications as any situation where um, people can be um, manipulated emotionally. Um, you know, if you've got automated systems that are capable of doing that with some degree of, of convincingness and some degree of approximation of what humans do, then you can think about a wide range of, of sort of um, applications and instances, you know, whether it's commercial or, or, or any other, where that could be used very powerfully, um, far more powerfully than, you know, the current generation of systems that don't really do it particularly convincingly in most of the time. Um, what is going on when ChatGPT gets things wrong? So the question, what's going on when ChatGPT is getting things wrong? Um, it, it's simply that it's um, it's not responding from, from a position of knowledge, really, I would say. Um, it, it simply means that um, it, the internal workings of the transformer have decided that that particular sequence of numbers that it's output is the one that's most likely to be appropriate. Um, and as humans assessing the quality of that output, that's just not the case, you know. And and, and this phenomenon of, of these responses being, um, you know, fabricated, I mean, it's sometimes called hallucinations and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a common enough um, occurrence. It's not an unusual thing. Um, and there are plenty of examples of, you know, someone asking um, ChatGPT to recommend books about a particular topic and it'll just make one up you know probably because it's very close to something that does exist and 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 for whatever reason it hasn't you know it's not that it's getting it from a database you know it's not it's not picking up a fixed sentence and giving you that it's constructing this based on these these, these patterns that it's learned um, and that's why occasionally you get things wrong but then when people are astonished by that you know i, I often think well which human beings are you interacting with? I mean, most of the human beings I interact with on a regular basis get things wrong from time to time, including me. I'm sure I've made 
you know, more than one mistake during the course of this talk, not intentionally, I just probably got something wrong. You know, we do that. And so it's no surprise that systems we build do the same thing. So what's stopping ChatGPT having one more level of um, question before it sends you the answer, check in the database of books that do exist to, to recommend whether this book has actually existed or not? It's just slower, just slows it down. Because again, there, there's, a, there's an emphasis on trying to get it respond, to respond in real time. And if you put in your query and then 35 minutes later, it said, ding, you, you, you're off, you're, you're, doing, <laughs> you're doing other things, right? So, it's trying to make it as accurate as possible and as rapid as possible. And that's a trade-off usually. I, I, I appreciate we're sort of over time a little bit, but I say we started a little bit late, but I, I appreciate people might have trains to catch and things like that. So maybe we should sort of draw things to a close at this point, but I'm really happy to sort of hang around at the front here. And if people do have things they want to ask me one-to-one, -one, um, we could perhaps do it that way. Um, that seems okay. But thank you all so much for coming. And I hope some of that was useful. And thanks to everyone on Zoom as well. And I'm sorry we didn't get to more of your questions. But um, yeah, as I say, I hope some of that was useful. And um, enjoy any other festival events that you're going to. Thank you.